Welcome to the podcast of Living Faith Fellowship in Klamath Falls, Oregon. We pray that God will use this sermon to speak to you directly. And now to Pastor Rich. So the music group Bread in the 1970s had a soft rock song called Everything I Own. Some of the lyrics say this. You sheltered me from harm. You kept me warm. You gave my life to me. You set me free. The finest years I've ever known were years I had with you. And I would give everything I own. I'd give up my life, my heart, my home, everything I own. Now, although that's a secular song, I want us to think about those lyrics when it comes to Jesus in our lives. Think about this. Jesus, you sheltered me. You kept me warm. You gave life to me and set me free. Everything I own, my very life, my heart, my home, everything I have, I give to you. Dog and cat theology is how a lot of us treat the Lord, and I want to explain that to you. Dog theology says, you're everything to me. You've given me everything. I love you so much, so you must be God. Cat theology says, you do everything for me. You feed me. I must be God. Please open your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 3 as we return to that verse-by-verse study and that letter from the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi. As you're turning there, real quick, let's catch up where we were last week. Last week, the portion of Scripture we studied commended Timothy as a true son in the faith. We learned that Timothy had a pastor's heart to take care of the people, as Paul said that he had proven character And he was like-minded to take care of the people. Proving character in the original language means to be genuine or trustworthy. Now, spiritual maturity and proving character go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. But spiritual maturity is impossible in our lives without the work of the Holy Spirit. The Lord has to transform us and transform our character and renew our minds. So after telling the Philippian church about his son with proven character, Timothy, he said, I wanted to send Timothy to you right away. But then he added this P.S. to that message. As soon as I see how it goes with me. Then we're introduced to Epaphroditus. And we learned that Epaphroditus was the one who actually delivered this letter to the Philippian church. We learn, parents, that it's our responsibility to raise our kids up in a godly way that they would serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, our kids see proven character in us two ways. By one, by our example, and two, our humility. So if you have your Sunday sermon notes, Roman numeral one, rejoice. If your Bibles are open, Philippians chapter three, let's begin with verse one. The apostle Paul says, finally, my brethren, Rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you, it is safe. It's safe. Now, Wiersbe said about that word, finally, obviously, Paul was not ending the letter. He goes on for two more chapters. But what he was saying was, finally means now for the rest. I've taught you all these things, and now for the rest. Pay attention. Here it is. And then he says, rejoice. Rejoice. Christian, to rejoice is an action verb. It's something we are told to do as a response. It means to feel or to show great joy or delight. We're commanded to rejoice. We're commanded to show great joy. Remember, joy is the theme of the entire letter of the book of Philippians. He says it over and over again. What Paul is communicating is an abiding joy within the life of a believer reveals in us that we trust the Lord and that we believe he is in control. You know, so many times we find it hard to rejoice. We find it hard to have joy when things are not going according to our plan. If you're anything like me, you have your life planned, right? Here we go. And on this day, this is going to happen. And on this day, and when it doesn't go according to the plan of rich, 
I have a hard time rejoicing. But when I show joy through trials, through situations, it reveals to everyone around me that I trust the Lord and I know he's in control and I am not. There in your notes, when we believe the Lord's in control of all things, we will be filled with joy because we know our good father is not out to harm us through life circumstances. Can I just tell you, you probably heard God works all things together for good. And that is true. But not all things that happen in our life are good. But we know that our good, good father is going to work out every situation for our good and his glory if we love him. So we're not to only rejoice during the happy times or times that go according to the plan of rich. Because the Christian can rejoice always because it's not based on circumstances. It's based a relationship with the God of heaven and the promise that we can trust him. Listen to what John MacArthur said about rejoicing always. He said, there's no event or circumstance that can occur in the life of any Christian that should diminish our joy. And I would think, wait a minute. Maybe you're like me and you've had something tragic happen in your life and it shipwrecked you in your faith. You ever had that happen? Don't tell me. But you had something in your life happen and it shipwrecked you in your faith. And what John MacArthur is saying is there's no situation, there's no circumstance that should shipwreck you because your trust should be in the Lord, even if it doesn't feel good. Here's the secret. Circumstances can and always change. How many in here like change? Let me see your hands. Very few of us like change, right? I don't like change. But circumstances and situations will change. But the Lord will never change. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and how long? Forever. So some people who are going through trials find it really hard. And they would say things like, it is impossible to rejoice during this situation. And let me tell you something. In the flesh, they're absolutely right. Through terrible situations, it is impossible to rejoice in your own strength. But this is when you must rely on the Holy Spirit. You must rely on the comfort of God to comfort you. We're to rejoice in every circumstance, even during afflictions. And again, it takes supernatural joy, that from the Holy Spirit. This is what F.B. Meyer said about that. It's the duty, listen to these words, for us to cultivate this joy. We must steadfastly arrest any tendency to murmur or complain, to find fault with how God is dealing with us, or to elicit sympathy. There in your notes, but we don't rejoice because of tragedies in life, but we believe God is doing things in and through our circumstances, and he even turns evil into good for those who love Christ. Now you would say, oh, but you don't understand. So let the Apostle Paul say it to you. This is what he said in Romans 8, 28. And we know all things work together for good for those who love God for those who are called according to his purpose. We know it. So God promises to give beauty for ashes. And I love that because some of life's hardest deals, some of life's most terrible situations, God will turn around for beauty. I don't know how, I don't know when, but he will. Even, you know what I found out as a believer, which is so cool, that God is not happy with my sin. God does not approve of my sin, but do you know me? God loves me so much that even some sinful situations that I've been in down the road, he's turned around and used for good. So I can sit here in this pulpit and tell you, sin bad, God good. <laughs> <laughs> the enemy has the plan to stress out God's kids, but the Lord has a better plan. And what he's saying is, you can trust me. You can trust me. I'm not out to harm you. And then notice what Paul says, for me to write these same things to you is not tedious, but for you, it's safe. And that's kind of a weird saying, right? I understand it's not tedious for Paul to keep saying rejoice, 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 have joy, have joy, have joy. But he says it's safe. Why is it safe to rejoice always? Why? 
Well, Hebrews 11, 6 says this. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must first, number one, believe that he is. And number two, believe that he is going to reward those who diligently seek him. In order to please the Lord, two things have to happen. We must, yes, believe that he exists, but we must also believe that he's out for our good and that he's going to reward those who diligently, that's dog on a bone, seek after him. There in your notes, fear and negativity are enemies of faith in Jesus because both things can hinder our trust and our reliance on him. That's why it's safe to rejoice. It's safe to rejoice because fear is an enemy of our faith. Negativity is an enemy of our faith. Trust the Lord. Before we end this first point, let me tell you a few things that rejoicing does that benefits the believer. Okay, here's a list of them. The first one, doctors have discovered that a joy-filled person has a better immune system than negative people. It's crazy to think that our mental and our spiritual health have something to do with our physical health. Isn't that crazy? But joy and laughter, think about this. A joyful heart makes good like a medicine, I think the Bible says somewhere. So think about this. It can boost the cells in my mind and help my immune system. The second one is a joyful person experiences more pain tolerance. You know, if you're in constant pain every day, if you rejoice in the Lord, your pain tolerance is better. Isn't that crazy to believe? Here's another one. A joy-filled person has better heart health. It reduces stress hormones that affect the heart. And it could increase good cholesterol, too. So tell your doctor, rejoice always. <laughs> a joy-filled person experiences a stress reduction. Same thing. The fifth one, a joyful person has stronger relationships. Let me prove this one to you. You walk in Monday morning to work and there's Debbie Downer. And, and then there's a joy filled guy like Danny and Faye over here. Who do you want to go talk to? I don't want to go talk to Debbie Downer. I'm down enough. I don't need her help. I want to go talk to someone who's upbeat and joy filled. That's the person I want to talk to. Unless I'm in a mood, then I'll go talk to Debbie. <laughs> And finally, a joy-filled person has positive emotions because being joy-filled makes us feel calm and safe and energized and elated. And the chemicals that are released in our mind, it does wonders. It's incredible. So with all that being said, Roman numeral two, trying to earn God's favor. Ah, here's a good one. Look at verse two. Paul mentions three different kinds of people here. He says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. So the first one he talks about is beware of dogs. What's he talking about? Well, there's twofold. There during that time, there were packs of dogs that would go around town and they would just destroy things and they would eat garbage and just tear things up. And they're just feeding on this garbage in the streets. And what Wearsby says is Paul's not just naming names here, but he's comparing the false teachers to these dirty scavengers who were running amok in town. You know, over time, the Orthodox Jews began to believe that Gentiles were good for nothing except for to stoke the fires of hell. Now, if you've been in church more than twice or read your word more than twice, we know that the Jews were to receive the gospel first. But it was also meant for the Gentiles. It wasn't plan B. Paul said it this way in Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, the Jew first and then also the Greek. There in your notes, the Lord loved the Gentiles so much that the prophet Isaiah declared that the Messiah was to come to be a light to the Gentiles so they could find salvation in the Lord. Again, not plan B. Listen to the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah 42, 6. God the Father talking to God the Son. I, the Lord, have called you, capital Y, in righteousness and will hold your hand. 
I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people and as a light to the Gentiles. Even from the Old Testament, it was declared that the Gentiles were going to get saved. Think about this. So with this term dogs, he, he's basically saying there are these Jewish people who are telling these Gentiles that they had to become a Jew first and then they could be saved. So here's what you got to do to be saved. You got to follow these Ten Commandments, be circumcised, do all these different things. Then once you're a Jew, then you can go ahead and be saved. You know, the Apostle Peter kind of fell into this legalism. If you remember the story when they were down in Antioch and Peter and Paul were kind of ministering a little bit over here. And then all of a sudden, some Jews came down from Jerusalem and Peter began to be a hypocrite. This is what the Apostle Paul had to say to him. In one of my favorite passages, Galatians 2.11 now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed for certain men came from James. That's Jerusalem. He would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of all of them, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Next, Paul says this, beware the evil workers. I was kind of wondering, again, is he talking about Judaizers? Maybe so. But this is what F.B. Meyer believes about that. He said these people were the cranks of the church. You can tell F.B. Meyer's from a few years back, right? Cranks of the church. And I was like, what's a crank of the church? He went on to explain that these are the folks... Every new wind of doctrine, every new thing coming through the church, they would promote it and promote it and promote it. Have you heard of listening prayer? Have you heard of all these goofy things? And then they would promote it even above the gospel of Christ. Then Paul says, beware of the mutilation. And that's an easy one, right? He's talking about the circumcision. Another reference to Judaizers requiring circumcision before salvation. If a Jew went through the rite of circumcision, then a Gentile should go through the rite of circumcision to be saved. We know what circumcision is because God made a covenant with Abraham and his people to be circumcised as a physical sign of what happened inwardly for a covenant with God. There in your notes. In the New Testament, we learn circumcision was the cutting off of the flesh as a sign of the covenant with the Lord. But it also represents the fact that God wants to be Lord, even of the most intimate parts of your life. Paul said it this way in Colossians 2.11. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. But here, notice Paul says, but we are the circumcision. And he's talking to Gentile believers there in Philippi. We are the circumcision. Now, what a smack in the face that must have been to the Jews, right? These Jewish legalists were saying, we're right with God because we were circumcised. We follow the Mosaic law. We're God's people. And Paul said, oh, not so. We are the circumcision. The true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ are the true circumcision. Notice, who worship God in the spirit. Who worship God in spirit. Those who worship the Lord are the true circumcision, God's promised people, not those who just have outward signs of religiosity. It's those who worship God for real. Kenneth Wu said this, the word worship in the translation mean any service to Yahweh by a particular people. If a Jew heard that that was attributed to a Gentile, it would be a scandal. There in your notes. But worshiping in spirit means to engage your whole heart while exalting the Lord. The psalmist said in Psalms 145, 3, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. 
But where does that come from? Worship the Lord in spirit. Well, Jesus said it this way in the Gospel of John. Maybe you remember the story. Jesus comes to the woman at the well. And the woman at the well had been married five different times. And she's saying, you know, we worship here. You Jews worship there. And Jesus goes on this whole thing about telling her how she really ought to worship. And this is what he said in John 4, 24. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him two ways, in spirit and in truth. God question said this. True worship must be in spirit. Engage in the whole heart unless it's not real worship. If you're worshiping the Lord and you're not engaging your whole heart, you're just singing. That's all you're doing. At the same time, though, it has to be in truth because that's properly informed. You must know who this God is that you're worshiping. Who are you worshiping? Well, I believe in God. Great. What's his name? What is your God's name? We worship God in spirit and in truth. And unless you have a knowledge of God, who God is, you're not worshiping him in truth. Both are necessary to worship the Lord. The best combination is to worship God with your whole heart, but know who it is you're worshiping. The more we know about God, the more we appreciate him. The more we appreciate him, the deeper our worship. And the deeper our worship, the more God is glorified. So when we truly worship the Lord, this is what you're doing. Jesus, this is what you're worth to me. And when we open up our whole heart, Jesus, you're worth my whole heart to me. You are my everything. You have saved me. You keep me warm. All those things. That's true worship. What is Jesus worth to you? That's the question. And so my favorite part of this whole sermon is Roman numeral three. It's all dung. It's all dung. Yes, I said that right. Look at verse four. Paul says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if everyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and catch this, and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ." What Paul just did here, maybe you didn't hear it, is he gave his resume, his education, and his list of qualifications. You think you're something? I was perfect in the law. You think you're something? I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. My bloodline, my pedigree, my everything. I was all of it. But I counted all as loss to gain Christ. There in your notes... Paul was one of the best educated men of that day when it came to the Mosaic law and Judaism. He was more qualified than the very legalists who were harassing the church at Philippi. Listen to what he said in Colossians 2.20. If you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things, catch it, all these rules have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. All those rules won't do it. You need to know Jesus personally. And then as a love response, you're going to want to serve him. Rules don't work. If you think I'm, not, I'm wrong, go out to the bench at the bus stop out here and it says wet paint. Every one of us will touch and make sure that's wet paint. <laughs> Stay off the grass. Every one of us will do it. 
But the book of Acts tells us that Paul was one of the most educated men when it came to the law and scripture of that day. Had the best pedigree, the best bloodline, all those things. When you look at the standards of men, he was the most qualified guy on the planet. This is what Guzik said. Paul was of an elite set, the Pharisees, who had devotion to the law of God. In fact, there were never more than 6,000 Pharisees at a time. And here's the Apostle Paul who says, I was the Pharisee of Pharisees. Of the top 6,000 on the planet, I'm number one. And Paul could boast that he was such a good Jew and he had zeal for the Lord that he went around killing Christians. Verse 7, things were gained to me. I have counted as loss for Christ. Wearsby said when Paul met the Lord there in Acts chapter 9 and he trusted Jesus, he became a child of God instantly. It was a miracle that happened instantaneously. And do you know that God still does that today? About three weeks ago on a Sunday night, I got a phone call from Sky Lakes and uh, a guy wanted to talk and he didn't think he was going to make it to the morning and he wanted to talk to a pastor. So I started talking to him and he told me about that he's a really good guy and didn't do anything wrong and God should surely accept him. And so in the few minutes I had over the phone, I began to tell him that, you know, our righteousness is like filthy rags. And Matthew 5, 48 says that you must be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect. So if you're trying to get in by good works and I, I told this man, I said, I've never met your mom. I've never met you, but I'm bad. If I could talk to your mom, she would tell me you sinned in your lifetime. And I said, and if my mom could talk to you, she'd tell you the same thing. And so. As fate would have it, or the Lord stopped the conversation because I think it went too far, he went into a coughing fit and couldn't talk anymore. And he said, if you can come tomorrow morning, please come. And we hung up, and I didn't know if he was still alive or not. Monday morning, Austin and I went into his hospital room. I've never met a guy so excited to receive Christ in all my life. First thing the guy said after the introduction was, I've been up all night. And I know I've sinned and I know I need a savior and I know and I know and I know and I know. And I said, so you want to receive Christ right now? And he's like, yes, here's a man that may not make it through the day about jumped out of his bed to receive Christ. You want to talk about happy to receive Jesus. Austin and I led him to the Lord right then and there. And there's no doubt in my mind that it was authentic because this guy was. woo. I told that guy as I left his room. You know, I'm all gowned up the whole nine. As I left his room, I said, I probably won't see you this side of heaven again, but I'm going to see you at the feet of Jesus someday. And he said, amen, amen. I mean, the guy interrupted my prayer with an amen, a non-believer. I mean, my gosh, God still saves people like he saved the apostle Paul. Paul went from someone who thought that he could earn salvation to realizing in a moment that none of that stuff mattered. He needed him some Jesus. Kenneth Wu said this, the word gain is plural, meaning gains. But the word loss is singular. Had all these gains, but all of it was lost in a moment. In verse 8, Paul said, I counted all my previous life's work as rubbish that I might gain Christ. There in your notes, the word rubbish in the original language only appears once in the New Testament, and it's better translated as dung. It's animal feces. It's something worthless or detestable. Imagine what Paul's saying. Here's my resume. Here is my seminary degree. It's dung. It's detestable. It's worthless. It's garbage. There in your notes, Paul communicated that even if a person lost all the worldly prestige, wealth, and fame, a personal relationship with Jesus was the central point of a Christian's life. And again, Paul, in Acts 22, it says he went to the best seminaries. And he was taking his degree from seminary, and he was taking his resume, and he was tearing it up, saying, it's nothing. He said, in fact, it's dung. And then notice what he says. The excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. The excellence. Listen to what he said in Romans 8, 18. 
Paul said, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What trials are you going through? Paul was in jail and getting ready to be killed. And he said, I consider all these trials to be nothing compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. He counted everything as lost just to gain Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 16, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Several weeks ago, maybe you remember the quote from Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool to give up those things he can't keep to gain what he cannot lose. So as practical applications, this is how I want to start. I, I thought I would bring up my prestigious degree. This is my master's degree. True story. It's my master's degree. And this is my resume. See the handsome mug there? This is my resume. And someone told me it's really long the other day. A staff member actually told me that. And I told him that's because I'm old and I've been around a long time. My resume and my master's degree. And I thought, you know what? If Paul could do it, so could I. <laughs> I started with that song by Bread, right? It's that soft rock song from the 70s, and it said, You sheltered me. You kept me warm. You gave my life to me. You set me free. The finest years I've ever known were the years I spent with you. And I would give everything. I'd give you my very heart, my very life. I would give you everything I own. And again, though it's a secular song, think about those words to Jesus. Jesus, you sheltered me. You kept me warm. You gave my life to me. You set me free. Gregory Brown asks, so how do we gain Christ? And how does a non-believer become saved? And even better than that is how does a believer grow in the intimacy with Christ? I, I think if I pulled everybody in the room, do you want to grow into a more intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? And I would hazard to say most of us would. So here's how it starts. It starts by Romans 10, 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When you think about the Apostle Paul's testimony and how he wanted to gain Christ, not only for salvation, but for sanctification, there's some things I want to share with you as we close. Number one there in your notes, to gain Christ, we consider our achievements as loss. Again, in verse eight, the word rubbish is dung. And I think about that. You know, I actually worked really hard on my master's degree. <laughs> I sold a business and went, went to college after I was already an adult with four kids in tow. And let me tell you, when you get old like that, it's hard to write essays. It's it, theology's tough. It's a tough thing, but it's dung compared to knowing Christ. It's dung compared to anything else. That guy in Sky Lakes, man, if I could have another guy saved today, I'd rip up my real resume <laughs> and my real degree. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, to gain Christ, Christ must be our priority. You know, Jesus doesn't want to be your second boyfriend. He doesn't want the passenger seat. He wants to be in the driver's seat. He wants to be in control. And by the way, when he is, things go right. He must be first and have priority in every aspect of my life. Number three, to gain Christ, we must have faith. Faith. Again, Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it is impossible, not hard, it's impossible to please him. For those who come to God must, number one, believe that he is, and number two, believe that he is a rewarder of those who dog and a bone diligently seek after him. You see, on the cross, this great exchange happened. God the Father made Jesus Christ to become sin for us. And in exchange, we get to become the righteousness of God in him. He took our sin 
And he gave us Christ's righteousness. If we believe in the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we believe that with our whole heart, then we will be saved and he will give us his righteousness. And finally, number four, to gain Christ, we continually cultivate our desire for him. This is so important. I want you to think about this. Sandra and I have been together over 30 years, three decades. I know that's hard to believe since I seem 29 years old. But we've been together for over three decades. And imagine me saying this. And if you know my wife at all, this would even be funnier. But imagine me saying this to my wife. Honey, 30 some years ago, I told you I love you. If anything ever changes, I'll let you know. That probably won't go as well as you think. (laughs) No matter how bad you think it is, it's going to be worse than that. But we treat the Lord that way sometimes is we don't cultivate our relationship. Sometimes, you know, I got saved when I was, you know, 15. I'm good, you know. And no, we need to cultivate it. And we cultivate it by knowing him more. How do we know him more? Study his word, be in prayer, have a relationship, communication, growing in him. The second way we cultivate our desire for Christ by being around like minded believers. Again, I said this a few weeks ago that, you know, I've heard so many times as a pastor, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. No, but to be an obedient one, you do. Ooh, how could you say that? Well, the writer of Hebrews said it. And this is what he said. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And catch this. And so much more as you see the day approaching. If you're like me, you probably check out headlines throughout the day, right? I can't watch news anymore because my blood pressure won't let me. But I do check out the headlines and I think, surely, Lord, it's not going to be long now. If you did that to Sodom and Gomorrah, it's not going to be long now. Well, if you truly believe that the Lord could come back, this is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. And so much more as you see the day approaching. We need to be around like minded believers to share share our burdens and our pains and our blessings as well. Third one. We cultivate our desire for Christ by persevering through trials. Persevering through trials. Do you know what I found out? That trials are pretty impressive. Everybody gets them. You know, whether you're serving the Lord or not serving the Lord, you're going to get trials. And and like I said, maybe something in your walk has shipwrecked you in your faith. I know I had something like that young in my Christian walk. I had something totally shipwreck me in my faith. And instead of pressing into the Lord and going to the one who could be the God of all comfort and and go to the one who understood my pain and all that, I ran. I pulled a Jonah. And, And the way we cultivate a relationship with Jesus is when we were heartbroken. It's terrible. This trial, man, it stinks. That's the Greek word for it. It really stinks. It's tough. So why not go to the lover of your soul who cares about you and knows you and formed you when you were in your mother's womb? And he knows how to console you and love you and build you back up. Don't run from God. Trials will make you do one thing. Run from God or run to God. Please don't run from God. Please don't persevere through the trial. We don't rejoice when something terrible happens. We just don't. But we believe God is the God of all comfort. We believe God has a purpose, even in the storm. And God is going to set our ship straight. And he's going to get us there. He didn't bring us this far to kick us off the cliff. And he'll even turn evil into good because he's a good, good father. You know, Jesus is so much better than the things of this world. And so many times we believe the lie of the enemy who wants to confuse us and then say God's holding out on us. And it's nothing new. That's what he did to to Eve in the garden, right? God's holding out on you. God's not giving you his best. And that's such a lie. And so Paul would say it's safe to tell you to rejoice. Why is it safe? Because if you don't rejoice and become Debbie Downer, And then you start thinking the whole world, the the sky is falling, Chicken Little. Let me tell you something. God is sovereign. God is in control. 
And that in control, sovereign God loves you. So crazy. He loves you. And he's got a plan for you. He's got a purpose for your life. So rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. And it's not tedious to continue to remind you. Rejoice. It's safe. It's safe because you're in the arms of Jesus. Worship team, would you come on up and get us out of here with a song to praise the Lord who loves us. And it's safe to rejoice. And would you pray with me? Thank you for listening to Pastor Rich's message. Next week, we will continue in the book of Philippians. Join us every Sunday morning in person at 9 a.m. or 1030 a.m. Online at 1030 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Watch our live stream on our website, YouTube, or Facebook. Our website is livingfaithklamath.com. Find our social media by searching for Living Faith Fellowship Klamath. You can also find all of our links in the description of this week's episode. All sermons are available on our website. Find resources at the top and then click on sermons. If you want to show your appreciation, you can tell others about us, subscribe to our podcast, and you can also leave a review so more people can hear the word of God. Thank you again and God bless you.